podcast. Ah, ya. Okay, it's 10 a.m. and um, one minute in Boston, in United States. I think that we can start. Right now we are 57 participants connected from around the world and whereas everybody is joining us and today we have a very big audience and we expect even much more. Um, we can give a brief introduction of what is in five before we move with this super special session. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Safira Castaño. I am the president of Infire Foundation and it's my great pleasure to uh, moderate this round table together with amazing speakers around the world. But before we start with this uh, round table, I would like to explain briefly what is Infi and what we are doing. In Infi, we are trying is a platform of talent with more than 1,000 people. This year, 300 and more than 350 new members joined the platform. And in this, in this platform, what we are trying to do is reconnect the migrated talent, all of the professionals who left Spain or Portugal in this case, and are working around, around the world with the schools, with the universities, with the students and professors from the uh, universities from their home country. Uh, in this platform, the University of Minho and Aveiro in Portugal are reconnecting with the migrated talent and are working in a collaborative platform together with the University of Valladolid, La Laguna, Europea Miguel de Cervantes, Oviedo, Politécnica de Valencia, Málaga and Sevilla in Spain. And also we reconnect all of these talent, the students, professors with business, with companies that are looking for talent and looking to recruit uh, this talent around the world and trying to attract them to their companies. And also we are um, connecting them with local governments. The idea is to promote international knowledge flow, collaborations, innovation, and career profiles of excellence. And how we do it? We do it uh, with different activities. At Infi, we have the Infi Connects, which is the virtual platform where everybody is colliding, is proposing new ideas, sharing uh, information. And then we have multiple activities to promote uh, these collaborations, these global collaborations, like, for example, the Nodal Award, that is um, a competition for, for seed grants. Uh, then this is followed by a bootcamp, an idea accelerator that is called the Venture Building Program. 
Then we have in five courses where we try to share knowledge uh, with what is happening, not only in your city and not only in your university, but also around the world to give you a more global idea and um, to help you to think out of the box. Uh, also, we have training for professors, personalized international mentorship and career support. We have international fellowships. 60% of the students has been uh, hosted by Harvard University and MIT at the University, uh, United States. Also, we have inquiry recruiting to promote the recruitment by these companies with who we are, we are working. We have Science 2.0 and international uh, conference. You can find more information in our website. I don't want to spend more time on this because I want to give uh, the priority to the, to the round table. Um, I know that there are a lot of students who want to uh, convert these hours in, uh, of education into credits in their university and they come. Uh, these quarter courses uh, mean 30 hours in education. And in order to get those credits, you have to meet three criteria. One, being a student or a professor from one of these nine universities. Second, you have to attend the live classes or watch the recorded classes or complete the practical exercise and complete the, the practical exercise. And finally, you have to send all the information and assignments before May 3rd to QC at Infi.org. Again, you can find more information in Infi.org, specifically in five courses. And let's move to this amazing round table uh, that is different careers in science. Here the idea is to give you an overview of uh, different career paths that maybe you never considered before uh, through the experience of different speakers. And today I am uh, very uh, pleased to introduce the next speakers. As you can see, they are, coming, they are connecting from United States, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany, and USA. This is the beauty of this platform, that we can connect to your house, people from different parts of the world, and bring, bring you uh, their experience. So let's start with Ana Cadete. Ana Cadete is a scientist at Moderna, and her focus is the development of nano careers for the delivery of mRNA. She's also the director of the International Mentor Program in Portugal, who has been leading it in the past three years. And previously, Ana was a postdoctoral researcher at Novobiotic Pharmaceuticals in collaboration with the Langer Lab at the Koch Institute in MIT. Funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, she designed multiple vehicles for the delivery of Tixovactin, a potent antimicrobial peptide against uh, the tuberculosis. Anna is also the founder of the Non-Conformist Scientist, an online platform created to communicate science and empower women in science. And you can follow her, she's very active in all of the social platforms in NCS Scientist, in Instagram, everywhere. Hello, Anna. Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay, so then we have Sofia Marban. Sofia Marban comes from a different uh, part. It's not healthcare. She's joining us from Belgium. Uh, Sofia is also the director of Infi Behavioral Science in, in Spain. And she is a, soci a sociologist and former international aid worker specialist in gender issues and corporate social responsibility. She has five years of work experience in the domain of international cooperation for the development managing public policies, projects, and programs are dealing with socioeconomic and human development in international NGOs, development agencies, and multilateral organizations like the United Nations in countries such as Vietnam, Bolivia, Mauritania, and Cameroon. Her professional experiences encompass project and contract management responsibilities, technical cooperation, intergovernmental support, and socio-political analysis. For six years now, she has been working at the European Commission, beginning as a Blue Book trainee in 2016. We would love to hear more about that, Sofia. Mm -hmm. Sure. In, in the same the Directorate General where she currently works. Hence, it might be said she's closing a professional and vital circle. After having worked for a short period of time at the DG for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations, and three years at the DG for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations, she has managed to found her place in the interinstitutional relations sectors, as well as by developing a high profile in legislative coordination and decision-making processes. Welcome, Sofia. Thank you very much again for 
being with us. Thanks, Safira. Thanks to you. Joanna. Joanna Vieiras is uh, joining us from Switzerland. After a bachelor in physics and applied maths to astronomy at the University of Porto in Portugal, she completed in 2010 a master in physics with minor in biomedical engineering in Switzerland. In 2012, she started a doctoral program in biotechnology and bioengineering, or so in Switzerland, and she graduated in 2017 with a PhD in systems biology which focus on the optimization of protein synthesis and modeling of cancer metabolism. During her PhD in 2016, she also did a full year internship in a pharmaceutical company, Merrimack Pharmaceuticals in Boston, as a computational modeler. She started her career as a medical writer in, regula in regulatory affairs in 2018, with a one year internship at Holtman La Roche and she's currently a senior regulatory writer at Novartis. So this is going to be very interesting to learn all of this path uh, since 2018. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Now we are moving to Tomás. Tomás is a postdoc researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Science in Leipzig, in Germany. His main research focus is shared between identical universal principles of language processing in the human brain and identifying how the variation among world languages impacts their implementation in the brain structure and function. Medical doctor by training, he moved to the field of cognitive science for his PhD at Berlin School of Mind and Brain at the Hamdol University, where he extended his scientific background to linguistic and neuroscience. This is super interesting, Thomas. Currently, he is the responsible investigator for a large longitudinal study investigating brain plasticity while providing control language learning conditions to a cohort of young Syrian refugees. Welcome, Tomas. Hi, and thank you for the invitation. And finally, and not the last but not least, like we say, is Katarina, closing the, the clock and coming back to the United States. Katarina Abreu is a strategy consultant, so we have consulting as well, for CS Associates, specializing in global health economics and outcomes research. As her main focus, she partners with global teams at pharmaceutical companies to develop evidence and scientific communications for a number of therapies. Her work has supported the commercialization of an patient access to therapies in oncology, ophthalmology, and rare disease. Katarina holds an MPH in Health Policy and Management from Columbia University and lives in New York with her rescue cat, Puka. Congratulations. Welcome, Katarina. And congratulations, for the cat. <laughs> thank okay. you very much for having me, and thank you. So, as you can see, we have United States Pharma, we have international aid in the European Commission in Belgium, we have a regulatory writer in Switzerland, we have academia in Germany, and we have consulting in United States. Uh, what are the goals of this uh, roundtable? So first, uh, we would like to, that you learn about different career paths that you can follow. We want you to understand the process to achieve all of those positions. And third, uh, we want you to build, um, we want to build a personality profile from each career path to help you to assess where you fit better based on your uh, skills, based on your personality. Because if uh, you are aware of the individual development plan, usually in the IDPs, what they do is you take like a person, they start analyzing what are your skills, what is your personality, what are your values, and then they define what is the best suit for you and a proposed career path for you. Today, what we are going to do is the opposite. We start from different career paths. We are going to um, start describing what are the skills, what are the paths, what are the personalities in each career path. And then finally, you can be active and you can think, oh, okay, so I can fit better here or there or there. At the end, you can send any question um, in the Q&A and we will translate to our speakers. So far, we have 87 participants. So I want to launch the first poll um, and interact with you before we move to the first question.
The poll, the question is, which career path seems more interesting for you? Um, we have 60% of the people vote. I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, one, closing. Okay, so here are the results that you vote. Uh, in the first position is, is academia with a 38%. Industry is coming after with 32%. Uh, then consultant is with 5%. Uh, medical writing three, scientific policy three, other 5%. And not sure, is 15%. Hopefully after this um, round table, this not sure is going to decrease this, this percentage. Okay, so let's um, move to the questions that I have to ask. Um, today is going to be an interactive, uh, an interactive uh, masterclass. I want to start filling all of this table and then share it with you. Uh, with all of the responses that everybody was answering. So perhaps we're going to start in the same order that I was presenting everybody. The first question that I want to uh, ask you is, how is your day by day? Anna, in the industry. Yeah, so I have to say, so now I'm, a, I'm actually a senior scientist. And so when you start growing in a company, you start having your... Uh, um, the time that you spend in the lab is uh, is actually lower than it was in the beginning. So I have to say that, uh, you know, when you join a company and as a scientist, and at least from my experience here, is that they hire you because you bring in a, a very specific skill. So in my case, um, I'm a formulation scientist. And so I was hired to, to formulate uh, mRNA medicines. And so I needed to spend a lot of time in the lab. Um, after now three years and becoming more a senior scientist, I start having some research associates working with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I tend to spend less time in the lab now, although I'm not completely outside of the lab. And this is really nice because I still like to, to have my hands on and to be able to not think, but also um, actually do some of the, the experiments. So I wouldn't put 80%, but probably at this moment, like 60% of my time is in the lab. And then, you know, the rest of the time is, uh, I still have to design the experiments. You can actually like put probably 30% by designing, analyzing, uh, and brainstorming. You know, I, what I really like about the, the position that I have is that it's a challenge position. And so I have a lot of meetings with my colleagues about brainstorming and what can we do to improve the system we are developing. And then we have always like probably 10% of my time is related with general meetings with, uh, well, with, uh, with the other groups. Because uh, one thing that I really like about, uh, about the industry is that the collaboration that we have with the other teams. And so we have uh, weekly meetings with the, uh, with the in vitro biology, for example, or the immunology group. So you tend to have a lot of collaboration uh, with, the, with the others. So pretty much I would, I would say that that could fit uh, well in, uh, in what I'm, I'm currently doing. That's well, good. I think that uh, we have to explain to the people that this is more or less, let's talk about entry positions, right? So when you are a scientist who is starting in a pharmaceutical company, so it will be more easy to compare between. Yeah, us, yeah. Right? I mean, this 60%, yeah. you know, can be between 60 and 80% and you have all of the yeah. other parts. And then it, it again, it depends a little bit. Uh, you know, the projects also have uh, ramping up moments where I was, you know, spending more than eight hours a day in the lab. Sometimes, you know, things are, kind of slower when your collaborators are the one like handling more it. So, you know, it, it could vary, but uh, for sure that the scientist position uh, still uh, needs you to be in the lab. Wonderful. So now let's move to Sophia. 
Yes, hi. So, uh, first of all, uh, please bear with me if I use too, uh, too much bureaucratic or political or administrative language. I mean, I will try to avoid this kind of terminology, but it's not, I mean, I cannot uh, guarantee. So, um, I mean, my main responsibilities, uh, I am in charge of the very first stage or phase of the decision making the process in the commission, which are like three phases. It's planning, consultation and decision. So, uh, I mean, the legislative adoption of any proposal or any uh, initiative. So uh, for the planning part, uh, I coordinate, let's say, the, the political validation of uh, uh, highly sensitive or important uh, files in the area in the domain of international cooperation and aid. So that tackles six regions around the world. I will not go into detail uh, uh, about that, but I provide support and advice to my uh, colleagues uh, at the director general level uh, in terms of uh, the implementation of these planning procedures for these uh, proposals. So it's very much related to procedural law or legal affairs, even if I am a sociologist, but it's very much linked to this, uh, to this area. So um, I also That's monitor... Okay. Let me... Yeah. Let me interrupt you. <laughs> From a person who sure. doesn't know about the world and um, just to, to try to understand. So you are Absolutely. planning and then consulting and then decisions. In the planning part, uh, your day by mm -hmm. day, as it means that you have to read and you have to think or you have to meet groups and decide. I have to, yeah. I mean, it's like very much linked to coordination. I mean, to, to provide advice and guidance and uh, recommend how to apply a certain uh legal uh, procedure a financing agreement an annual action plan uh, in guinea equatorial or i don't know uganda or bolivia and and how to fit that correctly in the system in the system in terms of that uh, so i mean i i will like to follow also what anna just said like the breakdown of uh, um percentage maybe i mean uh in terms of coordination with other units, with other colleagues. Uh, my director general is, is a huge uh, a complex uh, structure. So I would say that uh, 30, 40% it's coordination with other services, with other units, geographical and thematical units. So uh, in many areas, sustainable development, youth, uh, gender equality, trade. So 40% uh, of uh, coordination. Um, also follow up monitoring so uh the weekly agenda of the uh, college of commissioners so the college of commissioners the commissioners are like the ministries of the european commission so we follow that agenda they meet weekly so we need to know uh which proposals are tabled by other director generals so we uh, follow up those uh, proposals so that the external dimension uh, policy uh, forum or external relations policy are covered are uh, properly included in those um, uh, in, in those legislative uh, acts or proposals so yeah of course this implies a lot of reading and a lot of coordination also with all the units in charge so that uh, multilateralism or our policies or strategic uh, priorities are included uh, on that um, on that proposals that potentially will be will be adopted and uh, and passed. And uh, as another item and element, I could uh, mention the organization of corporate events. Uh, that I, um, in fact, the last months uh, involved in, uh, for instance, uh, the Corporation Days, which is an internal, a yearly event that we organize, that we coordinate. Uh, and we also coordinate with the people, with the colleagues working in EU delegations. So on the ground, uh, the EU is represented in not all, not every, but uh, at least 140 uh, uh, representations or embassies, um, they act as the ears and uh, yeah, the, the voice vis-a-vis uh, -vis national authorities and the populations in the host countries. So we are organizing for the very first time a totally virtual event and it requires a lot of uh, yeah, 
coordination, preparing briefings in terms of logistics, uh, defining or fine tuning the agenda, high level panelists. So uh, yeah, we could say that uh, it's, uh, oh. it's, a, it's a challenging position, but uh, yeah, tremendously interesting. But, yep. Will be like Tell the, me, event, the coordination of the cooperation corporation events, or how we can. Uh, well, now nowadays, currently or recently, it takes like sixty percent of my time. But yeah. uh, I mean, um, I think that in April, once the event will be uh, held, it will be all the things, you know. But okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, are you comfortable saying thirty to forty percent co coordination of other units, reading, designing, mm -hmm. is following agendas by weekly meetings, and then sixty percent is coordination of corporation events? Just yeah, let's put it this way. Yeah, more okay. in a mm -hmm. sure. Super busy today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. So, Thanks. next we have Joanna's right. Yes. Jana, how is your day by day? Okay, so first of all, there's a tricky thing here that I have to define. <laughs> so medical writing is a quite broad field of medical writing for, it could be for patient related uh, uh, um, texts, it could be healthcare providers, it could be regulatory agencies. So everything that I'm going to say, it's going to focus a little bit more on the position of being a regulatory writer in pharma, right? Because that's what I have more experience for. Yeah. Uh, so everything else that is related with being a medical writer to write journals for uh, like articles for uh, scientific journals and uh, all the other uh, medical writing things that exist out there, it's, it might be a completely different day from what I might be describing here. So I just wanted to touch upon that. Um, then, uh, so uh, um, my work um, uh, in a pharmaceutical company is, is, is a type of work that uh, um, pandemic or non-pandemic, non, non I can do it fully uh, offline by doing it at home or outside of the office. It's actually very common that uh, you, these positions are actually, sometimes they don't happen inside the pharmaceutical industries, but they are also that we have medical writers that are contracted externally and they work from different countries and so on. Um, and we have also colleagues that work in this for, uh, format with us. Um, then, uh, so that said, uh, that means that um, uh, I can, I currently have a lot of my interactions and even while I was in the office, most of my interactions and most of my meetings were happened virtual, happening virtually, even though most of the people sometimes that I was interacted interacting with were in the same campus, but it was just easier not to have to ship buildings and so on. So in terms of the job itself, the things that I do and breaking it down in terms of percentages, where it's quite interesting to understand in regulatory writing and uh, I came to learn uh, about it with the job itself, is that you think a medical writer is just doing writing, right? But that's not it. So if I have to put a percentage on that, I would say that perhaps 40 to 50%, and this of course depends on how you're progressing in your career. So currently I'm a senior regulatory writer, but then uh, once I move into uh, uh, expert, principal and so on, uh, there might be a lot of more uh, managerial uh, tasks that I'll have to do when supervising and so on. And then it means that my breakdown for the writing will also start to shrink. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that perhaps 40 to 50% of it is like, bulk writing where you, you start a draft so that the, 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 the drafts that we develop are uh, documents that go either to uh, uh, regulatory agencies like uh, EMA or FDA for the submissions, the packages for uh, putting products into the market. And uh, so these are very uh, complex documents uh, and often uh, uh, they are documents that communicate with each other. So um, this, this, what, what this means is that um, uh, I do this bulk writing, right? This 40 to 50 percent. Then I have meetings, uh, and then these you can put on the other percentage, and you can put the, all these meetings into these other percentage of things that I have to do. So I have meetings with the teams, and who are these teams? So the teams are the, all the authors that are. So I'm the author of this document, but all these other people in the team are also co-authoring the document with me, but I'm the one writing it. It's quite 
complicated that way. So who are these people? They are uh, statisticians, they are programmers, uh, they are labeling experts, they are submission specialists, they are uh, clinical experts, uh, clinical trial managers. Um, so all the people that would be uh, uh, involved in the clinical mm -hmm. trials, they are, uh, and also then on the labeling and the submissions, they will also be giving input into the document. So I'll have meetings that will be uh, um, for uh, discussing uh, the status of the trials, for example, to uh, um, negotiate timelines for me to write those documents. Uh, to have meetings about the status of the timelines of all the documents because they have to be written in a stacked way because they are all informing each other. So because of that, we also have meetings with all the writers that are assigned to each document so that we align on wording and on content and so on across documents. So there is a lot of alignment that needs to be done. Um, then there is... Um, uh, all the other meetings that I have to do in order to be able to conduct, to conduct the review cycles for the documents with the team. Um, and uh, th this will be uh, like time that I would spend preparing a document for review, then time that I would spend either following up with uh, every single team member by either call or via email, or maybe just having a consolidation meeting with all of them in order to align in case there are comments on the document that are uh, they have discrepancies. Um, and then the approval of the document and then the signing off of the document. And every single step of these has to be audited. And I have to take into account every single change. So since the moment that I produced the first draft of the document and every single change has to be auditable and has to be tracked. So all of these has to be uh, taken care of and that is feeding into the part of the, the percentage that it, I, I sometimes do not consider it writing. <laughs> uh, so then, of course, then there's all the meetings that I would have. We can put 10% for these in, into trainings for updated guidance, um, department meetings, um, you know, things like that. And the other thing that um, uh, it's important to understand on the, uh, on the regulatory writer day by day is that I'm not assigned to just one document, I'm assigned to several documents, which means that I might be working on two or three different submissions at the same time for three different types of documents. It could be a summary of clinical efficacy for one submission, it could be a, a clinical study report for another submission, and it could be a, a clinical overview for another one. And this also means that it could be completely different therapeutic areas at the same time. So you have to be able to have an understanding of all of these uh, uh, therapeutic areas and be very adaptable and flexible and uh, um, uh, be able to, to, to have some management of uh, all these uh, timelines and projects at the same time. Okay, so will you feel comfortable saying that 40 to 50% is writing, uh, preparing the drafts, for INDs, blah, 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 30% mm -hmm. is review the docs that should be auditable. Mm -hmm. And then 10% is for presentations, 10% for meetings to align with the needs and with other people. Yes. Okay. Yes, that sounds okay. all right. Then some percentage of it could also be that you get involved into, uh, you know, um, initiatives that the organization might have in order to improve processes okay. and how we work together, yeah, things like that. Wonderful, thank you very much. Let's move to Tomas, academia. We are more, I guess that we are more familiarized with academia. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have to say that from, we, from what we l heard until now, uh, it's actually very funny that there is a, a big overlap. So there are, um, we have a very romantic idea of academia and lab work, uh, which is very far from reality. Uh, and uh, all this administrative stuff that uh, goes around all the positions that we talked about, review processes and so on, it's exactly the same in academia. Okay. So, uh, f first of all, Again, like uh, Anna said, it's something that changes from the beginning of your career 
to uh, to the middle and the end. It's always you get more and more paperwork and less hands-on work. And the hands-on part is even at the very beginning quite low if you're not working in the wet lab, which is my case. So for me, the the actual time that I spent testing was uh, maybe five percent of my PhD probably even less um, <clears throat> so it's actually a lot of a lot of it it's about reading and writing um, it's first of all the staying up to date uh, the trying to get something written down and this is something that you try to do every day but not really don't don't really uh manage to but this these are things that belong to your daily routine when for for us in in cognitive science and in this kind of of, of research most of it is troubleshooting so you have uh, you have to get an analysis done. You have to prepare an experiment. This all, all of this has to be programmed. And basically it's 90% of the time trying to make the scripts work and then they work and it's done in two days. Yes. Uh, so how will you uh, design your percentage? Uh, in lab experiments. Experiments is including designing, uh, executing, and then analyzing the results. In your case, you will say like 60, and then grant writing 20, presentations and meetings, and them. Uh, in my case, the grant writing is uh, very small because uh, the Max Planck Society doesn't have that. We uh, the Max Planck Society is funded by the German state, and uh, we don't have to apply for funds. Okay. So we only apply for funds for uh, extra projects where we have to hire extra people. What and we also don't have a lot of teaching. We what we do have uh, a lot in turn is uh, supervision, and I think this is something. Uh, very important okay. doing uh, mentoring of other students and guiding them uh, because uh, and this is again a lot of uh, review psycho it's uh, designing projects together with your students and then you give them feedback and yes. there's a lot of back and forth here and this is uh, a lot of your time and then you have the la the lab duties so the lab meetings where papers are discussed or where you have to introduce something or you have to give feedback on the results of someone or the project that they are conceiving so how will you design by percentage uh, your time uh, 60 percent lab experiments. can you give me a percentage uh, we have lab experiments grant writing and reading teaching, mentoring, presentations, and meetings? Mm, I would say like teaching, mentoring, 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, for the presentations and meetings, like 10 each. Okay. Um, for grant writing and reading? Uh, Oof, this should add up to two. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're having a bit of a problem here. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> scientist. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say grant writing and reading 20% uh, and 30% uh, writing. Wonderful. Thank you, Thomas. Let's move to Katarina. Um, can you disclose your day by day in percentage? Uh, how do you use yeah. it? Yeah. So um, before I do that, I want to give a really brief overview of what HOR is because it's a term that it's a new field, it's a growing field, and I get a lot of questions about what it is. 
So to understand what I do, I think it's helpful to take a step back and just um, sort of give a brief overview. So a lot of us know that um, therapies and drugs, they go through clinical trials and then they go through the market authorization. So what happens once the EMA or the FDA gives approval, you have to decide how are they going to be funded so that they get to patients. And in a perfect world with unlimited resources, we would just say yes to all the drugs. We would say, yes, everybody gets all the drugs that they want and it's perfect and everyone is healthy and happy. But we do not live in this world. Um, in fact, a lot of decision makers uh, in health ministries, um, with health insurance companies, clinicians, hospital administrators, they have this problem of, well, my resources are very limited or limited and we have rising healthcare costs. So how do we decide which therapy for a uh, disease to pay for in comparison to other therapies. This is how Health Economics and Outcomes Research, or HOR, was born. Um, so this is a field where it is, it allows decision makers to make these decisions in a rigorous and informed and objective manner. Um, so you're looking at the value of a drug. How do I, demonstrate the value of a therapy when there are five competing therapies on the market already to treat a disease. So you're going to look at what is the clinical effectiveness compared to other therapies, what is the cost, and what is the uh, intangible benefits to a patient. So um, a lot of pharmaceutical companies, um, they will be very interested in, in doing this work and presenting this evidence to um, you know these decision makers and they will contract out HEOR consultancies or vendors to do that work for them and so this is where I come in um, when a lot of people hear the word consulting they think McKinsey Deloitte Ernst & Young and management consulting which you know consulting is a very sexy word but it's also a very vague term what is it exactly this kind of consulting that I do, um, it is highly technical, highly rigorous, and very interested in objectively and scientifically um, representing uh, these drugs and allowing decision makers to compare effectiveness and safety and value of these drugs with other drugs in the market. Mm -hmm. um, it's multidisciplinary because uh, you can specialize in one field or be a generalist. Um, and by that, I mean, you can, you know, do epidemiology, biostatistics, uh, systematic literature reviews, economic modeling, or burden of disease studies. So I am a generalist. Um, my focus is on economic modeling. So I do, I build cost effectiveness models and I do literature reviews and some epidemiology studies. And at my consultancy, um, because it's a consultancy, the number of projects that I currently have, uh, that I have on any given day is going to range from two to five research projects at the same time. Not all of them are active at the same time and they are very diverse in terms of what client, depending on what client needs and depending on what staffing we have available on my team. So, um, some of those projects, for the projects that are active, I spend about 70% of my time um, doing project work. Uh, so half of that time, so let's say 30% is in front of a computer doing data analysis or scientific writing because you still have to write up the results and you still have to present the results to different audiences. Sometimes those audiences do not have a science background, so you need to interpret the science for these audiences. Um, 30% in my current role is doing um, a combination and we're just going to put it a combination because the number of projects I have that are active fluctuates so that this is sort of an average. Um, it's going to be involved in meetings doing study design so I'm very involved in study design. Um, meeting with clients to make sure that I that we understand what they want and that we help them solve their problem. Um, meeting with team members so that they understand what is happening and so that we can work together to produce a highly rigorous and high quality document or data. 
Um, and then also learning about the disease area. I am working on projects in three different disease areas and I need to often spend a lot of time learning and understanding the clinical trials and the science behind these therapies. So that should add to 70%, right? So what about 50% data analysis and scientific work, 30% combination of meetings for project design with clients and team members and 20% reading for your training? Or so I would do I would do um, thirty percent of data analysis and scientific work. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I would do thirty percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so sorry, the next one is correct, and then um, ten percent of quality control of uh, data inputs of uh, technical reports and documents that we are handing over to our clients. Mm -hmm. um, 10% is in training. So I'm constantly learning about different diseases. Um, I'm reading government documents to understand what health policies are in different markets. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also just attending seminars and taking courses at universities to make sure that my understanding of the science is up to date. Okay. Um, and then 10% in business development. So in consulting, you are always writing proposals, uh, trying to win business, and trying to demonstrate that your team has the scientific know-how and the consultant, the, skill, the right skill sets to help them do their projects and help them achieve their objectives. Mm -hmm. And then the last 10% mm -hmm. is uh, growing the team. So I am currently in a new team that is like a startup environment but with the resources of a large consulting company. And so we spend a lot of time discussing strategy, what kind of work do we want to do? Who are we as a team? How do we present ourselves to the world, okay. to our clients and to our coworkers? Um, so that's how I would say I spend my day. Thank you very much. Uh, do you work online or do you have to be on site? Um, before the pandemic, it was a combination of both. So um, it depends on the relationships you have with your clients. Um, when I, before I came to ZS, I am in my current role now for six months. Before ZS, I was at ICON as an associate health economist, and I was more behind the computer doing data analysis and cost effectiveness modeling. Um, as you get more senior in your role, just like uh, Anna and the others have described, um, you begin to take on more responsibility with the clients and managing the relationship that you have with your clients so that you can, you know, um, make sure that they're happy with you, make sure that you understand what they want, that so you communicate. Um, so that means on-site traveling. Um, we present papers at academic conferences. So I do spend some time traveling to academic conferences and presenting um, any publications that come out of our work. I will stop you over there because this is another topic to discuss later on. <laughs> but I love uh, this first round because uh, I was learning a lot. There are a lot of uh, career paths that they didn't know and this was a great overview and a great introduction where we are going to spend the most of the time discussing what you do and what exactly is that uh, career path. Now we are going to move faster and also because we are running out of time, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I hope that we can expand a little bit, but we have to be mindful with the time of the people. So I would like you to ask, what was the path that you follow to arrive to your position? And it has to be in three words, like bachelor degree in this, master Oops. degree in this, and PhD in this. Let's do it very simplified. Uh, let's start. Zafira, let me just add something <laughs> like a... Because Katarina was so specific in her percentages, just to make sure that, uh, you know, in, a, in a, well, I believe in academia, medical writing and, and uh, in industry as well. Well, there's a lot of reading as well. We also go to meetings. We incorporate, you grow your team as well. So there's many things that uh, at the end uh, end up like overlapping with uh, what should be your time. And uh, I think that's kind of general to, uh, to everyone. I think it's, it's great that it's written there, but I think it can kind of apply to, to many of our uh, week. You know, it's probably not every day that I do that, but it's, uh, 
like a team grow and that I think is very important and companies do actually think a lot about how can we enable uh, a better collaboration and uh, um, and that so I think it's uh, yes, it's good. great to have you there it's just like more broadened as well yes thank you Katarina okay so let's move to the path industry Anna PhD for sure mm -hmm. so to be in the United States as an immigrant, there's no other way to come here without uh, without a PhD. Zapir, do you want us to just answer the three questions in the row? Because I think it's much more, they are going to be, you know, I mean, uh, you, you need, a, uh, the skill set is pretty much the same. I don't know how you want us to, to describe, but uh, you know, it's like you, you need a PhD to be a scientist. There's no other way, to, at least in the United States. If you are American, you can have a lot of experience as research associate uh but if not you need a phd so yes so phd uh, if you are international in usa um i will say also green card hmm. because well uh, i feel like there's a different meeting conversation they, i don't think you should write there it's uh, there's other ways to come to the united states without the green card i think that's helpful but i i I wouldn't uh, leave it there. That, that can be kind of a misconception. You have O1 visas, you have H1B, you have uh, J1 to start. So I would say that you for sure need a visa, but uh, you know we, we can have a different discussion about how you can sponsor your, uh, your way to the United States. So I uh, write this in cursive because uh, it's so competitive, the industry. So green card is basically what they are expecting from you to have. Just leave it like, well, it's not it, mandatory. I didn't have a green card. I still don't yeah. have a green card and I'm here, <laughs> right? So yeah. I think there's other ways to, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, with your skill set, you just need to be, um, you know, there, there's, pre, there's not a lot of formulation scientists, so you need to be uh, a kind of an expert in a field to be able for them to, to, to bring you here as, a, as an international. And again, for example, as a J1, you can come to an industry for a year and do an internship, and then there's other ways to sponsor your, uh, uh, your stay in the, in the United States. Uh, for sure that the green card is a plus, but I don't think it should be the only way for you to, to be able to be a scientist here. This will be a, a, another big uh, discussion, the visa. Let's move to the skill sets. Uh, as you mentioned, I think that is a good idea. Let's answer these three uh, questions. Path, skill set, and education required. A skill set, I, this is in terms of communication skills, well, um, good in so you fine technical, um, a skill that you are bringing to the company, what are they looking for? Expertise. Expertise in the scientific field. It can be, you know, in my case, is a formulation scientist. It could be immunology, uh, biology, uh, in vitro experiments, pathology. So you, you, you really need to be an expert in a, in the, in a medical, in a medical, uh, in the, in the specific uh, field. Um, and then, of course, you know, like if you are a team player, good communicator, etc., that helps. Uh, but I don't think this will make them uh, choose you to 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 join, unless there's many other people that can do the same job, yeah. which is usually that doesn't happen. Um, and in terms of uh, of education, uh, so I'm a pharmacist by training, uh, which is also really curious because the majority of people that work with me, they are not pharmacists. So pharmacists in the United States go to the pharmacy and in Portugal and Spain, a pharmacist is, a, is, is a, uh, if we choose the PhD pathway is actually the ones that are going to formulate medicines. So I have a master in, in pharmacy, I'm a pharmacist, but this pathway can be taken by biomedical engineers, biochemists, etc. And then I have a, a PhD uh, in nanomedicine. I, I already did a PhD with an European grant. So I left Portugal after I studied. So I have a PhD and then I have a postdoc at MIT. And this is something that I feel uh, it's, uh, it was one of the best advices I got when I came to the United States uh, because I wanted to join a company and they told me 
that I should do a postdoc first and try to go to a really good university. And so I did a postdoc. So that was a very good advice. I think if you want to come here, you, 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 you need to be a postdoc first to take that, that route. Wonderful. Let's move to Sofia. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I will try to be uh, brief. Uh, well, uh, I am a contract agent in the European Commission. I am not a EU official. So for contract agents, uh, they are classified in several groups. So I am group four, let's say, let's put it that way. Uh, so you, what you need is a completed university studies and at least three years of, uh, of professional experience that's tested by a diploma. I mean, you have to, you need to have a bachelor, uh, um, preferably a master. And I, of course, have colleagues who are PhDs in several uh, branches or areas in economics, international relations, uh, development cooperation, uh, whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, voila. And um, I can pass to the uh, skills section, maybe? Yes. If, yeah, okay. So, um, well, of course, to be a good uh, communicator, it will also depend on the area where you work. If you work maybe in finance and contracts, you don't need to communicate so much to the uh, outside world if you want, but um, problem solving to be able to take decisions uh, quickly and uh, rapidly. A very important highlight is to uh, uh, be flexible, to adapt to new environments, um, to management dynamics, um, also to be sensitive to cultural differences. I think that this is common to all of the uh, uh, speakers here, but I will also like to, yeah, to point out to be respectful, to be tolerant, to have like uh, high ethical and uh, yeah, uh, moral standards and to apply it uh, in the work uh, in the workplace. What else did I want to say? Yeah, in my particular case, um, to be able to analyze uh, huge amounts of imp information and, and to structure them well, to be able to prioritize um, and to work under pressure, to be uh, stress and uh, yeah, resilient, uh, stress resistant. So. Um, and uh, last but not least, of course, to be engaged uh, uh, with the work at the very end. I mean, this is public administration, of course, but we uh, at the commission, they take an important decision that affects a lot of population around the world. So it's important uh, uh, at, at the end to, 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 to be engaged. Um, so, yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. I think that also some of these, we can move them to the personality. We will add also some... Okay but I think that this match as well. I'm yeah, sure. I did a mixture. I did a, okay. yes. I combined a bit uh, yeah, hard so skills, uh, yes. soft skills. Yes, wonderful. And the last uh, question is education required? Well, I think that I, I already mentioned it. Well, uh, I, I didn't go into the detail of my professional path. I wanted also to mention a bit my experiences on the grants on, in different countries with different organizations before uh, coming to the, to the EU. But I would uh, insist, I would repeat, uh, say it again, bachelor, master degree and PhD is not so necessarily. I mean, it's not like, uh, yeah, it's not so required for, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Sofia. Let's move Thank on. you. Jana. Yes. Um, so just one thing for medical writing, don't put just online, put also hybrid, just because you have the two modalities. Um, and I'm also doing it uh, as a hybrid. Um, for uh, can, I, can you just show me on top the headers as of the... Yeah. The path, yes, the thanks. Color. Yes. So, um, so for the path, uh, I'll tell you what I think it worked for me. Uh, so for me, it was definitely, um, so having a PhD, uh, but uh, uh, there was also two other things. The fact that I did an internship in industry, which gave me the perspective of knowing what, uh, what is the drug development process, uh, knowing a bit about pharmacology, about drug safety, um, and understanding other therapeutic areas that were not related to what I was working on, for example. Um, 
uh, this helped me uh, also to get into the position that uh, I currently have in medical writing. So it was the PhD, it was the fact that I did an, indus an industry internship and the fact that uh, I decided to invest in myself after a PhD and uh, of ac actually after um, a PhD and a six month postdoc, I decided to go back, invest myself in myself, which I understand that this might be a difficult situation for a lot of people to, to not, they do not wish to go back. Um, I did a one year internship at Roche in medical writing. So, and this is what made me in, to, to be able to be in the position that I'm currently uh, am because I got all the training and all the skills that I needed on the very good uh, training that I got at Roche. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is he said? Sorry. What about the skill set? Uh, the skill uh, set. Zafira, yeah. let, let me just add, because this is a round table and I think, uh, you know, you go by bullet points, <laughs> but, uh, you know, life is not a bullet point. I think what <laughs> Juan is telling us is, is really important because, you know, you, you, you do a PhD, you invest so many years of your life in having a technical expertise, and then you decide to give a step back and go into an internship, which is not... Uh, you know, it's not what you 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 thought you 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 could take, and that completely shifts your your career. And and Joanna started. I I mean, I think she has a an, an incredible background because she started as a physicist and in a, in a astronomy. And uh, you know, she did an internship in in Boston in a pharma company, which already delayed her PhD. And this is a choice that you need to do. Is like, am I going to go to industry? delay my PhD, is it worth or not? And it is. And then again, after having the PhD degree, then say, well, this is not what I want to do. I need to give another step back. And I feel like this is really important to tell students is, is this, sometimes you need to give a step back, uh, do an internship and then understand what you want to do with your career. So I think it's great. To Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for pointing that out because that was exactly the point I was trying to make. I think that this is really important to pass this message across because uh, uh, I think students still think that they have to follow some kind of a straight line, but they do not even have the answers to know what is that straight line. So yeah, that's, that's really important. Yeah. So on, on the skills, uh, I, of course, I'm not going to make it very long, but to say that it's writing. So uh, ability to write clear and concise and succinct text, that's the most uh, it's right there above on the top, together with being able to adapt it to target audiences. So it could be regulatory agencies, but it could also be if you're doing the different types of medical writing, it could be a different uh, audience, it could be patient, and then you cannot have the same kind of technical language. Um, high attention to detail and uh, uh, high uh, willingness to really produce quality documents. So this level of detailing, uh, like almost being nerd, like being the grammar police, that's exactly the profile. So if you want to put it there <laughs> or somewhere, that, that's being the grammar police, basically. Um, so yeah, so I would say that those and communication. So communication, very, very important in my line of work uh, because of the communication that I have to do with the teams. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, what about, I think education requires, uh, if you want to follow this one, in your case, you were finding your passion in your way, right? But mm -hmm. it's a more direct uh, path to get it, if you get not, that or not. They're not necessarily. Uh, uh, so the, you will, if you if you talk to different medical writers, you find that there is a lot of, uh, so you, you can have people from uh, graduates Without PhD, you can have, you can have graduates from biomedical science, health science, biotechnology, science communication, journalism. You can find all of those doing medical writing jobs. Not sure if all of them of all of them are going to fit into the industry and regulatory writing. Those maybe there is some preference for uh, PhDs because we have a background on statistical analysis. Maybe some people even from that were doing clinical trials before they can become medical writers as well. So. It's quite uh, flexible, and this is also another message that's very important to pass across. It's very flexible, and you, and it's not just in medical writing. You might find this in other careers paths as well. That there is a, this flexibility, and you have many, many skills that you can uh, translate into these other careers. Wonderful. Okay. 
So let's move to consultant uh, academia. Sorry, Thomas. I think that is clear. Yes. So uh, okay. I think that first the path is this one is the obvious one. Everyone knows it. It's the one that uh, uh, the whole university is built for. Um, I mean, you cannot be a professor without having a PhD. Uh, <laughs> uh, the thing that I actually would like to stress here is that when we think about research and when we think about academia, we um, think about, and the whole system is built to create professors, but of course it doesn't create a lot of professors. So from from everyone who starts a, re a real academic research path uh, in the basic sciences, most of them don't become professors, not even research group leaders. So I think that the, the, the very important thing that we have into account is that the, both the skills um, and your daily routines depend a lot on the roles that you play in a research team and I think that there are um, there are like three fundamental roles that are the ones that that come out the most um, I've uh, uh, read something about five roles in general but I think these three are the fundamental ones and they are very different I mean we have the 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 leader who is more of a visionary is, is someone who's looking into the future, looking about new ideas and new concepts, but they are really not the ones who are implementing the stuff. Then you have people who are uh, more of team workers that do support, they help the students and they help to integrate stuff and they implement stuff. And then we have uh, people who are, um, like critical they are very much about critical thinking about analyzing stuff uh in their more the the technical support staff and um these three roles have a completely different skill set and so i mean everyone should be able to 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 fulfill the different roles but in the end, if you're in a team where people are working together, why should you be doing something uh, that you're not very good at when there are other people who are much better at doing that? And for example, the, the question of communication, it's, it's fundamental, but there are a lot of people who are uh, not very good at, at expressing ideas, but they are very good at implementing them. Okay, so can we summarize the skill set in academia uh, like a uh, skill in writing and communicating and doing good science? Um, being creative and, uh, and critical thinking. Okay. Let's move to Katerina. So first of all, um, I, I just want to say, Anna and Joanna, what you have discussed about flexibility and different career paths, it really, really resonated with me. Um, and thank you for bringing up this point because it's consistent with my own experience and consistent with what I have seen in my line of work. So my own personal path was a Bachelor of Science in Economics, so very focused on applied mathematics and statistics. It was in Canada, and um, I came to the United States uh, 11 years ago um, because my mother is Portuguese-American, and I got citizenship through my mother. So because of the citizenship, um, I was able to get a research associate position at a Boston University's teaching hospital, um, helping clinical trials and helping uh, manage clinical trials, but I could not get further without higher education. So I went back to school to um, get my master's in public health uh, in health policy. 
um, in management, but I also took a lot of statistical uh, programming and analysis courses and a lot of epidemiology courses. Um, so that was the path and the master's program really connected me to internships and that helped me come into HUR consulting. So my current position, you cannot become a consultant. Even if you have a PhD, you still need experience in the field, whether it's through an internship or doing a number of years as a consultant um, or as an associate consultant or an analyst. And the reason is that you can be extremely technically qualified, but you have to learn other skill sets to advance further in the career. What are the so, skill sets then? Yeah. So skill sets, definitely um, statistical analysis and uh, ability to understand uh, study design and the basic principles of research. Um, you need, you have to be able to work in a team because it is very multidisciplinary and nothing is ever done by yourself. You depend on other people for your success. Um, you need to have clear communication. You need to speak up when you don't know something and speak up when you do know something. So that becomes essential to getting project work done within deadlines and within budget. Um, the other skill set I would say is good writing and you need, um, you need to have emotional intelligence and soft skills. You need to be able to speak to clients. You need to be able to speak to people from all sorts of different cultures, personalities, and backgrounds. Um, the education required varies. So many people on my team have different educational backgrounds, but I would say the common themes are some sort of a graduate level degree in the life sciences or in medicine or in pharmacy or in biostatistics. Okay. We do have a few PhDs with um, engineering, engineering PhDs on my team, and they build a lot of the models from scratch. Um, so you can really come in with all sorts of different backgrounds, but you need to have that aptitude for uh, quantitative um, analysis and that intellectual curiosity to be able to learn about new diseases and therapies and then translate that into um, evidence uh, generation. Okay. I think that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we have more of the of the table done. I think that the personality we can um, um, the yeah the personality we can remove this last section because I think that we have been talking about that. It's a good thing worker, flexible. Uh, then into the uh, deadlines. I would like to um, spend only one second, and this is going to be a range, but it's always a taboo. It's always, I feel that talking about salaries, how much do you make? Nobody asks about that question, and nobody disclose it. Um, I, we just want to give you a range, and you have to put in context, because we are going to talk about salaries, uh, for example, it's not the same living in Portugal than living in Boston, where an apartment is $2,000 a month. So always take into account that we have to bring a context over there. But, um, and before that, I want to send quickly this, um, this next uh, poll that is uh, number two. Uh, which career path do you think that is better paid? Let's see what the almost 90 people who is following us today think about that. Um, I'm going to give you five, four, three, two, one, finish. So um, the result is 40% uh, things that industry pays the better, then almost 30% consulting, uh, then scientific policy, then medical writer, not sure, 6% and academia uh, in the last position. So can you give us a broad estimation based when you, where you are working, what is the entry salary? So for example, for a postdoc, uh, here in United States, um, entry salary will be like around 50,000 in United States based on the NIH guidelines. So what for a scientist in an industry? 
what for a consulting um you have that yeah Zafira. so in boston for example you can put between 80 and 100,000 for uh, scientists in uh, okay. entry level then it depends you know if you have a year or two of postdoc or if you didn't do uh, a postdoc um but again i would like to emphasize that uh, if you are alone in the united states even with 80,000 it's it's not easy to you know you you will never buy a house for example i think that's kind of important for people to know that the the salary the salaries here are very high but also the cost of living is 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 really really high in comparing with new york like uh, eh. and then it's again the i don't know what you mean by benefits if it's related with salary or it's like your career oh. or not but also no it's benefit you, this kind of jobs no Ah, okay okay yeah so this is more or less uh, I, I think like what you can write there is that usually industries pays better than academia considering that it's a kind of an expert level as well but the flexibility of your job is also very different so i think it's it's good to have the salary but think twice about making a decision of your life that is only based in how much you are going to make okay thank you anna Let's move to the next. Same order, Sofia. Yeah, so uh, in my position uh, as a contract agent in the commission, in any director general or in an executive agency, you can make between 50,000 euro to uh, 80,000 euro. Uh, I mean, you can Google it. Of course, the information is public. Uh, what is the starting salary for a contract agent? Uh, the salary grid is is of course public and uh, well every year of course there's a, a CDR, a career development review so depending on your performance on the goals achieved and accomplishments you can be upgraded so you can have a, an increase in your wage in, in your salary and um, well in terms of uh, I don't know benefits there's also something important to mention um, we have like uh, as expatriate staff we have a 16% of, uh, of allowance uh, until we get to 10 year residence uh, in Belgium. After that, they take it away from you. But I think that's an, an important um, and interesting benefit. Uh, also, well, I think that's the main uh, uh, information that I wanted to pass. Of course, it's not uh, the basic or the most important, the essential fundamental uh, um, thing uh, that to be uh, at. Um, I don't know what's the word, um, well, the economy, but uh, instead all the uh, opportunities, also in terms of uh, consultancies, there's a whole world around the European Commission that uh, recruits independent uh, external uh, consultants to help uh, in the design or, or in the defining of programs of policies in, in monitoring and evaluation and evaluating these uh, these programs that also can be considered uh, in terms of looking for for job or opportunities in in Brussels and around the EU institutions. Wonderful, Sophia. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Next one. Let's ask to uh, next one was uh, you, uh, Joan. So yeah, so did to everything that Anna did say already, mm -hmm. of course, um, uh, and also again taking into account that uh, I'm in Switzerland and uh, this is no way uh, different than Boston, actually very quite similar. Um, and if you want to compare it a little bit with Portugal, I would say the cost of life is more than twofold here um compared to portugal for example so um for uh, you're talking career uh, entry level no bonus no anything just like base salary that's yeah. what you're asking for so um so i would say and my experience is only in pharma so i cannot speak for any other type of medical writing uh so in this it would be something in between 100k and 120k yeah Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And don't forget that this is not yours. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Next one that we are going to ask is to Tomas. 
so uh, I don't think that people come to academia for <laughs> the salary. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it, I think that in this case, it even, uh, well, is this, is this even, it, it actually varies a lot. So if you are doing grant hopping, if you, and you actually manage to get, do land a really good grant, then you can have an actually very nice salary. Uh, that is even uh, adjusted to the country where you're living. Uh, for example, if you get an uh, 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 EU grant, an ERC, but that's rarely the case. And the salaries that you get from working in the university and or working for a research uh, 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 institute are not high even as a postdoc with experience leading a team. Okay, so um, maybe just as a reference uh, in USA, based on the NIH guidance, um, a first year postdoc is $53,000. Let's move to... Uh, last person, Katarina. Um, so I live in New York City, which is notoriously expensive. And I, um, please keep this in mind when I tell you the salary ranges. It is going to be very different from region to region. Um, and even within the US, New York City has higher salaries compared to the rest of the country for the same reasons, high cost. So um, I am not an entry level position. Um, I will give the figures for that though. Um, an entry level in HEOR consulting, if you come out with a PhD with no industry experience, um, entry level will be 65,000 to $90,000 a year. Um, that translates to about 54,000 uh, 54, euros a year to um, about 75,000 euros a year. Um, and then once you become a consultant, so once you get some experience and become a consultant from an associate or analyst, uh, the salary ranges from $90,000 a year to $130,000 a year. And in euros, that would be 75,000 euros a year to 100,000 euros a year. Okay, wonderful. Uh, in benefits, uh, my, my goal was to ask you, what are the benefits of your job? For example, academia can be flexible, no? So you can have more um, balance with your life or you can travel a lot or you can, what, two benefits that you have that you will highlight based on the type of job that you have. Okay, I don't know if this is called the benefit, but I can tell you why do I work in a biotech industry and uh, for the joy of one day see my product becoming a clinical trial. This is why I work in, uh, in industry. I, this should be enough, right? <laughs> um, I don't know, like, um, you know, life-work balance, uh, it's, it's still tricky. And I want to, you know, to tell people, this is a comment that I usually do, which is like, you cannot change lives by working nine to five. It's really hard. It's sometimes something that you, you will do once you have kids or not. But usually when you are young, you know, you are here to give it all. So we work really hard. Uh, we do try to have some work-life balance and I think it's getting better, uh, but, uh, the United States is not the place to be if you want to have that. I think that in uh, industry in Europe, probably you will get like in Germany, I don't know, Sweden, Denmark, probably is the place to be if you want to have that work-life balance, not here. Um, another benefit, uh, I don't know, I feel like as a, you know, I do not have kids, so I have a really I have a good life. I really like to work in Boston. It's in a, an amazing city. It's uh, very European. Um, I, I like the the company where I work. I like my team. So I feel like uh, I have a very good life. I'm I'm very happy with the, with the position that I have currently with the, with my with my life situation. What do you think about benefits and um, fast professional growth? 
Um, yeah, in, in industry, you have, you have a career, uh, you have career growth. So I was promoted as a senior scientist. Uh, you have goals well-defined that you need to follow uh, during the year to achieve those goals. And that will kind of dictate, uh, you know, how you can progress, uh, your bonus and, and et cetera. So I think you can really have a, a, fast, a fast progression in, in your career. And the good thing is that I, as you want to state it very well, you know, I don't know if one day I will also need to, to give a step back if I want to change careers, for example, going more into strategy or business development. Um, but for sure, I'm, I'm already in a level that uh, would allow me to, to do that with more, with more confidence and kind of already always progressing in my career. I feel like this is the, the way to go. Wonderful. Now let's move to Sofia. Yeah, uh, what I can say about traveling, maybe, uh, well, given the nature of my work, which is, uh, as I already explained, more linked to general coordination or interinstitutional relations and so on. Uh, and currently under these uh, pandemic uh, circumstances, I don't have the chance uh, to travel if I was to uh, manage uh, cooperation uh, programs in different countries, I would have the opportunity to, to go in failed missions. This is not the case, but in, well, uh, in the future, uh, I don't exclude the opportunity or the possibility to work in an EU delegation. So this is something to, to take into account. I already envisage maybe in five years or, or so on. And one of the benefits, of course, uh, of working in Brussels, which is, uh, well, the heart of Europe, one of the most, uh, uh, if not the first, at least on the top three uh, more intercultural, multicultural uh, cities uh, in Europe. It's tremendously uh, dynamic in terms of uh, uh, grassroots movements, uh, political activism and cultural super dynamics. So in that sense, I, I cannot complain. It, I'm also very happy. And um, in, the Europe, in the European Commission, you get to know and you are in permanent touch with people all over Europe, all over the world, different backgrounds, different origins. So that's one of the most um, yeah, important or at least uh, to me in personal terms, uh, things that I appreciate about uh, my daily routine and, and work also. So, yeah. Uh, let's move to Jana. I'm muting myself first. Uh, so in terms of uh, this type of benefits that uh, we are all touching upon. So for me, um, I get to work in a different therapeutic area, like maybe every quarter or, or sometimes even in parallel. So um, th that's like, for me, like learning all the time about the different therapeutic areas, about a new molecule, about a new mechanism, a new target. It's just like, for me, it co continues to feed my scientific curiosity. So that still works for me. So for me, that's still there. Um, and then, of course, all the learning of the new documents, because there are so many documents in regulatory and every, uh, since I started until now, I just keep learning of new ones. I, I'm continuously learning. So there is this progression that I'm still going through. And um, uh, then I would say that perhaps uh, uh, the fact, uh, the, uh, maybe the most important one, which made me switch from academia into industry um, and an industry position like this is the fact that I have the privilege uh, to be contributing to putting these drugs into the market for the people that really need it. And uh, that's a huge privilege. You know, I'm there for these discussions for what goes, the language that goes into these documents and the learnings that come from it. And I think that's just like tremendous. Thank you, Jana. Okay, next, Tomas. Uh, well, work-life balance is amazing, as everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I was, I was silly enough to think that uh, I would have like long holidays when the unis are closed and everything. Of course, of course. Um, 
and and also that I wouldn't have to work uh, at night as I had to as a medical doctor. Well, guess what? I also have to. <laughs> uh, but um, well, I think that the 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 main thing here, and it was the reason why I came I came to to academia. It's if you are excited about ideas, if you are excited about theoretical discussions and don't want to be bound by the applicability of something, this is in the end what you get from academia that you don't get elsewhere. But it's still a really small percentage of what you do. So be aware that uh, still a lot of the time will be uh, about discussing completely ridiculous technicalities. Yeah. Uh, and the the good thing is, and this is also the the thing there the the place for 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 learning and growth is always there, and it's always expected from you. Uh, it's always about learning a lot, and I think that uh, hopefully we'll step away from from having this hyper specialization, and we'll uh, in invest more and more into being more interdisciplinary and this is also something that then in your research career uh, allows you to open your perspective uh, once again because when from the moment you entered university your field of view was narrowing like this and at some point you get a super a super expert uh, on a really small thing. Will you say also the pace? Uh, I think that in industry there are goals, quarter goals, and you have to achieve them and put all of your skin in the. So, so, but in academia, you don't have those kind of goals. It's a project and you are going at your speed. Well, well, Yes and no, because you have you have the whole publish uh, or perish kind of thing. You have that deadlines for applying uh, to grants, and in the end, you don't have have any hard deadlines in your um, in your uh, set. But if you actually don't meet them and don't work for accomplishing certain things during a certain mm -hmm. amount of time, you you're losing the race yeah and i don't think this is right but it's definitely the way it has to be done okay thank you Tomás. let's move to the last one and then we are going to answer questions so start throwing i can see some questions and and we will give some time for to answer the questions Catalina. so um when you're working in industry um it's so important to find a company whose values align with yours. And so I'm very lucky to be working at a consultancy that really values um, the war its employees, the lives of its employees. So even though I'm working in the US, um, the benefits um, are generous in comparison to other companies here in the US. We have many European colleagues who also manage us. And so I would say culturally, um, you know, we're encouraged to take time off, to be with our families, to take maternity or paternity leave. So there's a lot of support for people with families. Um, and with that being said, I do not want to make it seem like um, the hours are nine to five, they're not. Um, the hours fluctuate quite a lot and it definitely can be very intense and fast paced, but you also have uh, down periods and you do have some flexibility with your time. So I can work remotely, for example, if I want to. And so this has allowed me to um, be with my family when they needed me close to them or to work in different locations. Um, during the pandemic, obviously travel is not an option. Um, so when the pandemic is done, hopefully soon, um, I'll be, I'll get to travel to different conferences and because my work is very focused on European and East Asian markets, um, I 
I tend to spend a lot of my time in Europe and I will be spending my time in India and Japan, um, which will be very interesting. Um, not just meeting clients, but also presenting at conferences and um, meeting my, my coworkers. I have the privilege of being able to work with people from different countries and cultures and every day I learn something new from them. Um, it feeds my intellectual curiosity. Um, it feeds my, my enjoyment of working with people and mentoring people. So there's a lot of opportunity for helping other people grow in an organization and I really enjoy that. Um, and also I would say uh, in the US because this is very important, um, make sure you have good health insurance. <laughs> Hmm. So uh, the health insurance um, plan, if I, I, I don't have a family or children, but should I have a family or children in your future, I would be happy with the health insurance that I have right now because it would be generously covering them as well. That's wonderful. Okay, so together in the past one year, uh, one hour and a half, sorry for passing and crossing this time, but I can see that everybody's super engaged and everybody was connected during all of this time. So that's why I decided to continue. Uh, let's move now to the Q&A. Uh, let's start reading the questions. Um, but before, and when I do that, um, I wanted to, um, I can um, and so here we go. Uh, I want to leave these resources in my computer if you are interested to create a roadmap with individual development plan. That is what we discussed at the beginning here. There are a couple of resources. Uh, Q&A. I don't know why I cannot access to the... Oh, let me see in the chat. Here we go. Uh, in the q and A, I am I am not seeing, can you access to the Q&A, any of you? Not I can, uh, and I I'm actually am so seeing, I'm actually seeing a question. Uh, yes. To add a column about the downfall as well. So not just the benefits, but what might be problematic. Mm. Yeah, I, this is my Q and A. Or can you can you share in the chat? Oh, it is your, in the chat, I have access. I don't know why it's locked. Sorry for because my Q and A is not allowing me to access. But if you want to write in the chat, please go ahead and we can read uh, in the chat the uh, your questions. Hmm. This is the first time that happened to me with the QA. Okay, whereas they are uh, writing the, the questions in the webinar chat, I'm going to last uh, uh, send the last poll. That is the poll number three. Mm. No, the poll number four, here we go. That the question is based on the round table discussions, where do you think you fit better after all of this discussion? I hope that the people who didn't have clear where they were fitting, now they can see themselves in a better place. I'm very sorry for the Q&A that I cannot. I can open the Q and A. Sorry, oh, I was muted. Oh, so go. I was go. talking, but I was muted. I was like, "Why is no one responding to me?" <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if you can read it, please go ahead, Anna. Yeah. So there was uh, here. There's already some uh, uh, answered questions, um, and so here there's already one uh, that I. So how easy is to become an entrepreneur from any of these fields? Uh, I, like, I think like because of the environment that I have in, in Boston, I think this is the best place to be if you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, when I was a postdoc at MIT, I took many classes, even in collaboration with the Sloan and Harvard Business School. Um, so if you want to start something in the field of, uh, 
Biomed, I would say this is the the perfect place to be. I don't know if others have a, a different entrepreneurial background. So, but yeah, as Katarina said, like there's people that also start their own consultancy companies. Um, yeah, actually, Anna, um, a lot of people um, of my old co-workers have gone in to do that. They usually partner with scientists or clinicians and they work together to build the company out because they usually have quite complementary skill sets. Yes. Indeed, we have one interview uh, that is recorded at Infi.org. Uh, you can access that. That was Jonathan Tong and he was first a postdoc at the Brigham Women's Hospital and he did an invention over there. Uh, they filed for a patent, and then he decided to continue with that as a company. And the company is today Platelets Biogenesis in Boston. Uh, it's a startup that raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So you can, as a scientist, come with an idea. Obviously, you will not have the background of um, for, for business development, but you can be the CSO, the chief scientific officer, because you know all of the uh, technical part and scientific part from that. Okay, do, you, do they have any other questions? Yes, I can see a lot. Yeah, so there's here uh, this one. Do you think it's worse uh, to take a PhD? Currently, I'm a master's student with a lot of doubts. Um, so I think like, Pretty much all of us can, can speak and even, you know, if you don't have a PhD, you, you, you know in your field. So for me, the answer is yes. Um, you know, like it took me two years after I defended my thesis to tell that it was worth. It's incredibly difficult and people that do a PhD to think is an easy way to go you're wrong it's really hard you you defend your thesis the majority of people are in a burnout you work many hours it's really complicated it's really really hard so it took me two years so i did a postdoc at mit extremely competitive uh, very hard and then i started working at Moderna. and after a year there i felt like okay this is the place to be i feel really good it's worth it's worth but it, it takes time Okay, let's move to the next question. Here are some, what kind of flexibility and autonomy for presenting ideas and projects do industry workers have in scientific fields? Should I answer as well? Um, yeah, other people want to ask? I, I, can, I can take this one. Um, I think really it depends on the company and the environment that you are in when you are interviewing and exploring options. Um, if this is something you are interested in, it is really important to ask your potential employers and make sure that they, this is the kind of company that would support it. Um, so I can speak from personal experience. I've been at two consultancies, one which did not support that and one which does. And um, I can say that it is possible to be very entrepreneurial and to present ideas and projects and very much um, enact the visions that you have, but it's more important to be in an environment and with a team that will support you to do that. Yeah. Next question, Anna. Let me see. Um... There's not many more questions here. Okay. This is pretty much. Um, I think yeah, there that's was it. some. Yeah, there was some that were already uh, answered, like uh, about Joanne, about work life balance. Uh, if you want to just uh, uh, tell us out loud a little bit about work life balance, if you want to comment. Uh, so yeah, well, the, the part of my answer to the question was that um, uh, it, it's true that there are times where you can get ethic. Uh, you can have multiple documents at the same time, multiple submissions, timelines that you have to uh, fulfill. Um, it might end up leading to you know quite a long hours and sometimes a couple of weekends that you might have to work on. But uh, of course. Please take this with a grain of salt. It will depend, depend also on the 
company you are in. I'm very lucky in the companies that I worked on and the company that I'm currently in. Um, they really, uh, I, I'm really proud of the way that they deal with flexibility and work-life balance and uh, all that they did in Novartis um, for the, the employees for the pandemic. Um, and uh, we, we do have the possibility of taking off time after working these extra hours. So um, we can use those hours, we can, uh, we, we can compensate basically. So this is very important. And that said, even with the headache periods that I do have, I still feel like I have quite a good work-life balance. Of course, I do not have kids currently, so that maybe I would perceive it in a different way if I did. But for the life that I lead currently, I, even during the active, the active periods, I do feel quite um, uh, fulfilled and that I have the, the balance that I need. There's here two more questions. So one is, uh, how do you get experience to work in this in scientific policy? So Sophie, I believe this is one is for you. How do you get uh, experience to work in the scientific policy? I mean, I can speak directly about uh, international cooperation development. I mean, I am a sociologist. When I finished my uh, degree in Barcelona, I decided to uh, after a volunteering experience in, in Brazil, in fact, to um, pursue this, uh, this career in the sense that I was interested in global solidarity, in geopolitics and so on. And I wanted to have that experience on the ground, in the field, getting to know the, the local populations and working directly with our partners formally said beneficiary, beneficiaries that I, I don't really much uh, like that, that term, but um, I would encourage uh, people to, 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 to enroll in any kind of uh, internship in masters uh, in international uh, relations or international cooperation development, uh, whatever the field uh, most uh, is most interesting uh, for you and to have experience uh, directly with uh, in, in the field, in the ground, in, in the countries that you are most interested in. I mean, there's international NGOs, there's uh, uh, consultancies, uh, there we have United Nations, uh, the World Bank, so multilateral organizations that offers a wide range, a very broad range of, of opportunities. So that's the path that uh, I followed. Uh, the last experience that I had uh, was in Mauritania with Action Against Hunger. And it wasn't the best uh, experience uh, in the sense that I had a sort of post-traumatic sh uh, shock. And uh, I was kind of stressed when I came back to Spain. I had a very good opportunity to go to Guatemala with the United Nations High Commissioner to, of Human Rights. And given that I had this uh, complicated experience more in the field of humanitarian action or humanitarian aid. It, was, it wasn't so much a, a development uh, because of the political uh, and security context in Mauritania. I decided to not take the challenge of going to Guatemala. And uh, since I was sort of missing the Western uh, uh, lifestyle and life standards, I decided to, 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 come, uh, to come to Brussels, to the European institutions to get, um, well, to have more information of how the funds, not only the funds, but uh, are managed in terms of better regulation, in terms of transparency, et cetera. Uh, so that's why in a sort of sense, I ended up in the EU institutions by saying no to uh, a position as a human rights officer, officer in Guatemala. So at the, at the very end, you have to take decisions. Uh, I don't regret any of those decisions, I, I must say. But um, yeah, I insist in encouraging all of anyone that is interested in scientific policy or more concretely, more specifically in international cooperation to have uh, um, direct experiences uh, when the time comes and when the pandemic allows to have um, yeah, life experiences in the ground with whatever international organization or NGO uh, uh, facilitates you to have that. So. Yeah, that's that's great, Sofia. Thank you. Let hmm. me just ask Joana just the last question. Zafir, I know this is the last one, but Joana, they are asking if uh, is there any medical writing uh, course that you would recommend? Yeah, I was just typing to someone uh, privately about that too. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I do not know about uh, many medical writing courses. Like there is no no specific 
specialization on it, but I know that you can go into the European Medical Writers Association or the American Medical Writers Association website. You can pay a, a kind of like a fee, a year fee. You can uh, enroll into webinars, into uh, conferences that they have and so on. You can learn a lot from what they publish. Uh, but f for me, it was much more relevant and also from the feedback that I had by networking and trying to find these uh, answers to these questions when I was thinking to go into this field um, was that learning hands-on like learning the context of the pharmaceutical industry is much much better you have all the training that you need and if they have the opportunities like internships or training programs you should definitely uh, do not look back as a set don't look at it as a, a setback look at it like i said as an investment in yourself it can be one year or two years of your life but it, you can it can result in you having a permanent position afterwards as well so think about it that way uh, and uh, you will learn it really in the context of where you are going to be working on later on. Uh, pharmaceutical companies might have this kind of uh, uh, trainships. Uh, I know that some CROs, contract research uh, um, agencies, might also have those, and other small uh, um, uh, scientific medical um, medical uh, writing agencies might also have it as well. So look for those, and this might be a, a very good gateway into it. Okay, we are really running out of time. Thank you very much, Joanna, for, for all of this advice, but not only to you, Joanna, to all of you, Anna Cadete, Tomás Gochar, Sofia Marvan, Catarina Abreu, Joanna Vieira. It was an amazing panel. I think that we got a lot of information from all of your experience. Obviously, we had to talk very broad because um, you are representing something very specific, and we had to take it like that. But it was really interesting. I'm sure the people who is interested to connect with you, you can, they can follow you in social media. Uh, I just want to close the, today the quarter course, uh, reminding you that if you are interested in the diploma, don't forget to fill in the exit survey. And that as always, you can follow us in our social media uh, for all of the updates. So thank you very much to all of you and to everybody who spent two hours of our Saturday. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for inviting a lot. us. Thank you. It was great. Thanks. Thank you.